In the 1950s, New Zealand needed workers. The doors were open to Pacific Islanders who arrived in their thousands with hopes of a better life. Many settled in Ponsonby and Grey Lynn, and the area soon became known as Little Polynesia. But by the 70s, the dream of a new life was turning sour. Pacific Islanders found themselves at the bottom of the heap, facing unemployment and widespread racism in a country that no longer wanted them. You give me the impression that you think that Polynesians are being treated as second-class citizens. Is this how you feel? Yeah, we're not getting a uh, fair deal on this society. That's why we're talking about the revolution. That's my Uncle Will. At just 20, he got together with a group of young Pacific Islanders in Māori who wanted to change the world. They became the Polynesian Panthers. My task for today is really simple, and that is to be your spiritual person, to be your backup, to be your supporter. You are going to do great things with your project. You are also going to reclaim a history, a Pacific urban history, um, that many people absolutely do not know. I just can't even contemplate walking down Franklin Road with, with the car and people hurling abuse and calling us niggers and telling us to go home. Just the Polynesian Panthers are part of my history, but I've never really known about them until now. This documentary tells their story. I have a Tongan and Māori whakapapa. I live in Auckland, just a few streets away from where my father and his brothers were raised in Ponsonby in the 1950s. Where's the coffee? Yeah. Dad grew up believing that to get ahead, he had to leave his Tongan heritage behind. I remember, you know, as a kid saying to Dad, you know, my brother and I would be saying, you know, Dad, speak, speak some Tongan to us, tell us some Tongan words. And he was like, no, no, you know, you need to just, you know, do what you're doing, head down, um, you know, bum up, just, you work hard and you just, you just fit in. Te kaha, tuno pai tonu ho etu. My son goes to a Māori language immersion unit. Takaha can celebrate his Māori and Tongan heritage in what is now the biggest Polynesian city in the world. But I'm starting to learn just how hard my uncle's generation had to fight for a whole lot of things my son and I now take for granted. At that time, it was so divisive, you know, you had these cars pulling up, calling a nigger, bunga da da da, go home and take off. Well, you know, none of us had the cars, so we couldn't follow them to chase them down, you know. But it got to the stage, and even when you're at school, you know, you were just put down at school. Um, you know, I mean, I became a, a prefect, really, because the Polynesians were having a riot at the school that I was. You know, I mean, I wasn't an ideal prefect. I mean... I was a second year six, I played league and basketball, I didn't play first 15 like your dad, you know, I didn't, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But they made me a prefect because they, we had a riot in the school. And the only, ra the only way I, I got that solved was because most of the Polynesians knew me on the outside, I was a member of the Nix. Yeah. So, you know, I quelled it within one month. I became like a cop actually, but I did it because I wanted to get my university entrance accredited, so, you know. You say you used to be gang members? What sort of gangs? Polynesian gangs are uh, the ones that were around a couple of years ago. Why did you make the change? What was it that caused you to become what you now call revolutionaries? Oh, the oppression and the racism that we suffer 24 hours a day. We were just really a bunch of young people. Um, our average age at that time was 20. Uh, specifically Māori and Pacific Islanders. This is where it's real crucial that we define the word Polynesian because basically we were all the same. And a lot of us were actually ex-gang members, were street people. We also had students, um, some that made the students. We had people who were students. We also had chapters in prisons. So we had a whole, whole range of different members. Um, we were specifically based in Ponsonby initially, and then we spread out uh, throughout Aotearoa with the furthest chapter being in Dunedin. Wow. 
they were a group of young, mainly, I think, um, New Zealand-born or certainly New Zealand-raised uh, Pacific Islanders who came to New Zealand or were born in New Zealand way before there were significant numbers of Pacific people in New Zealand. Uh, so in a sense, they were part of the same movement as, as, as other young people in New Zealand at the time, uh, but but really um, came, came of age um, and became politically organised uh, at a time when Pacific Island people in New Zealand, as temporary workers, as overstayers, uh, were facing severe um, political persecution. Initially, it was the uh, literature of the Black Panther Party in America that we got attracted to uh, the work they were doing in America. And uh, when we read these books deeper, we found out that the problems they were complaining about were the exact problems that we were seeing in New Zealand. So we decided to do something constructive and form the uh, Polynesian Panther Party. The legendary Black Panther Party grew out of the American Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. They were armed, political, and very cool. It's no wonder that when news of the Black Panthers hit the streets of Ponsonby, they captured the imaginations of young Polynesians. Uncle Will and his mates called a secret meeting in a friend's bedroom. It was actually packed. It was packed of uh, all sorts of um, young men from different gangs, different areas. We turned up and it was quite intimidating, really, for me. I mean, I, I was pretty scared. I mean, you know, I thought, oh, gang guys, you know, oh, you know, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, in the end, Etta's and parents came home unexpectedly and everyone just shot out the window. <laughs> we all just scarpered. When my father rocked up, I thought, oh, my God. And all the people who were there, he was just, uh, he was devastated. He said, oh, my God, they were up to no good. What are they doing here? So he just quickly told all these boys to get lost and so everyone just ran. I remember feeling really kind of excited to be part of this change thing that was mm. happening, you know, that maybe we've got a chance to do something. Um, and so, yeah, we were all keen to join. And they joined in force, with chapters opening across New Zealand. The central headquarters was in the heart of Ponsonby. So we basically, our organisation was above this building. So where was the entrance? The entrance was round about here. So you have fond memories of, of this place? You know, it was good because, I mean, it made us feel like we were established, you know, yeah, well, you know yeah. it was like a step up from a gang. Yeah. Now we had we an office. office. And so what would kind of go on up there, like your headquarters, what was up there? Well, we, that was where we had our meetings um, and had people come in you know, when they had problems. There was always something happening. Um, it would be something like uh, needing to go around and do a, a, a mailbox drop or something or there would be a demonstration against American imperialism happening in the People's Union and we need to go and support it. So we're there painting posters, placards. In just a few short years, this group of ex-street gang members and students had reinvented themselves as a political movement. They were lobbying in government, fighting for human rights and helping their community with everything from housing, food packages and education to prison visits and legal aid. They even had an employee. So um, I was um, over at Uncle Will's the other day and he, he showed me this. Was that some of your mahi? 1974 diary from, from the offices of the Polynesian Panther. My God, that's my writing, all right, Peter Howard. This is when I was the um, community worker for the Polynesian Panther Party. You were the only person that was actually employed by the Polynesian Panthers to kind of run all the administration and, and do all of that. And was that based up at Three Lamps Fire? Yes, um, up in Ponsonby Road, our first um, HQ we had there used to be West End News and, um, and we used to go out and deliver papers to pay the rent for it. <laughs> <laughs> So you people would call the office, like you, you guys are almost like a first stop yep. for Especially people that yeah, were Pacific in need. Island and, and Māori, yeah. One of the first things we got, there were children getting killed Franklin Road. Um, there was no pedestrian crossing. I um, got on to Auckland City Council and, you know, and demanded that we have a pedestrian crossing there because there was no pedestrian crossings along Ponds Road, particularly Franklin Road. Kids actually killed along here. Yeah, yeah. There were two kids got killed before we got into action, and so. Noi and kids, eh? Yeah, yeah. 
And so basically we went down to the council and told them, look, they've got to fix up, do something about these crossings, that kind of stuff. We gave them a period of time to get it done. I think it was three weeks, I think, or something. Um, and then nothing happened. So we decided to come then and just do a protest along here. And Amma was the one that was um, um, ahead of, the, of, this, of this project. And so we had traffic banked up all the way down that way down here. That's when the cops come flying in. And the cops came flying in and sort of said, what are you doing? And they kind of stuff. And they said, well, we want to get this crossing fixed up. And then three weeks later, they put the lights up. Hard to believe, you know, I live just down there. I never even knew that, you know, what you guys had done up here. I'm discovering a whole new side to my uncle. In my late teens and early 20s, I was all about having a good time. But at that age, Will and his Polynesian Panther mates had already started their fight for social change. Uncle Will has sent me to Rotorua to meet Nigel and Vicky, a panther romance who decades later are still together. He's Indian and she's Māori, so I'm curious about how they became central to the Polynesian Hi, panther Nigel. movement. Hmm. Lovely to find you. Yeah. I was the only Indian <laughs> in Ponsby virtually that, and all my mates were all, were all Polynesians. And, this, and I was never actually a member of the Polynesian Panthers. I was like an honorary member. <laughs> That's what they said, you're an honorary member. And after a while they said, no, 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 you're, you're blood. That's all there is to it. And that's how I ended up with the Panthers. They all had this belief and this kaupapa where they were going to fight for their people, even though Will was Tongan, you know, Vince was Samoan. All Polynesians to them were the same and they were doing their best for their people, and Nigel was doing his best for all his whānau, all the Polynesian whānau here. That's the first Panther office. Oh, wow, who's that in the That front was on Ponsby Road. Yes, yes. And it's... Um, Down uh, Three Lamps End, eh? Yep, right yep. on the end of the corner. I've got a photo here yeah. for you, actually, um, that my uncle gave me. And who's that, Fox? Uh, holy heck. So is that Tingy and you? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. And what have you got there? What are those? This is, um, this ball there. Ah, oh, it is too. Pacific Island immigrants valued education, but often parents didn't have the time or language skills needed to help their kids with their studies. So the Panthers became heavily involved in homework centres. A homework class organised by a local school teacher, and Panthers are amongst the helpers. Nigel is a fifth former at a local high school. Normally he supervises another class down the road, but tonight it's school holidays and only one class is operating, so he's come to help here instead. Reverend Beck was the one who gave us the church on Ponsby Road for homework centre, and plus he put a little pool table in. Well, put a pool table, a ping pong table, get the kids to come in. A lot of teachers gave um, free time after school, just to come and help. They'd go home and we wouldn't start the centre up till say six o'clock, so you have your dinner and whatever and then go to the centre. Other Panther-inspired operations are a bus carrying visitors, amongst them volunteer Panthers, to Paramaramo Prison every Saturday. The prison visits were set up for a lot of the young, young, especially like Waikiri and that was for the younger ones that had just gone in first First time they've ever been in prison, alone, didn't know no one. Their parents didn't even own a car or anything like that. They couldn't go down to visit them. So well, when the prison visit started, we set up a roster and said, OK, these are names of prisoners that have not, never had a visit. And Nigel told me that you spent your um, wedding night at the prison instead of on your honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. Registry office downtown, Jesus Christ Superstar movie, and then we had a program to perform. That is, go and visit the brothers out at Paremuremu. Um, the fact that we loved each other and were part of the Polynesian Panthers, we had work still to do, and that was go and see the brothers in prison. Because we know if a brother says, I've sent you an invite, please come, and we don't turn up, it's the saddest thing on earth you know, to have a brother locked up and his visit doesn't come through. 
The Panthers' prison visits were just one of their many social programs. Back home in Ponsonby, they were battling poverty and exploitative landlords. It's in conditions like these that many Polynesian, and indeed other immigrant families, are forced to spend their first years in New Zealand. The houses are a breeding ground for a multitude of social problems, problems which are often unfairly blamed on the immigrants themselves. I just remember my own cousin's house. That was the least accommodation. and um, The floorboards were rotten and there'd be no insulation at all around the walls. You could lie there at night and you'd just hear the rats running all over the floor. Yes, it uh, leaks all the time, this one does. Yeah. In Freeman's Bay, there are a lot of houses that were like that. Then you flush it, then you come back, you wait for it to fill again, then you've got to turn the tap off, otherwise it floods at the back of the toilet here. We would uh, quite often be in situations where the landlord would have uh, hired a security firm to come down and evict the person from the flat for not paying rent. So we would go down there and barricade ourselves in with the tenant and the security firm would come down um, and physically try and remove us uh, and we just wouldn't move. And, and this sent a message to the landlords that this was another part of justice, another part of fairness, uh, that we're not going to tolerate anymore. And you want us to live in the substandard housing and pay this amount, pay quite a high rent for what you're giving us. And you want us to be quiet about that? It isn't going to happen. I don't think I've ever really understood just how tough things were for our people. No wonder the Panthers felt like they had to take action. I've met some of them now, but I'm keen to see how the Panthers were seen at the time. They learned how to use the media, and considering their age, handled it well, even though they faced some pretty entrenched attitudes. Polynesians and Maoris have, have got a bit of a reputation for violence, um, for breaking bottles over people's heads and sticking their boot in and that sort of thing. Do you not really believe that this happens? Uh, it happens, yeah, but um, the fact that news media, like yourselves and that, um, really blow it out of proportion. You know, like, it's something to give to the public, eh? Hey? Media representations of violent, alcohol-fuelled Polynesians led police to form a special task force charged with cleaning up the inner city. Task force at that time was specifically targeting uh, pubs or public areas that were predominantly patroned by Māori or Pacific Islanders, or as we term Polynesian. And they were just specifically going around and just picking up people for just stupid little petty little crimes. The police in their wisdom think, OK, these people can't control themselves, can't handle the piss, we'll arrest them all. Because they, they all seem to be doing the same thing, uh, getting violent. So we bear the name of violent Pacific Island, violent Polynesians. Well, what do you expect after you tanked everybody up and then 10 o'clock closing time you just let them out? In most cases, the offenders are Polynesians, but the areas in which we operate are mainly Polynesian areas. There isn't um, any reason at all for them to, to be there. It's just the fact that them appearing like that and the reputation that they have creates trouble then and there. As a result of the task force, a large number of Polynesians were arrested. But there was no reliable access to legal advice, and so the Panthers started their own legal aid program. Some of the Panthers go down to the courts and they ask um, uh, anybody down there, mo mostly the Polynesians and the working class people down there, if they have a lawyer, we tell them it's their legal right to get a lawyer and that the government and the government pays for the law. The Panthers were having a social at the university and for some reason uh, the police turned up and uh, they just started arresting people en masse. 
And there was a crew from Greylin who I really wanted to protect and, and prevent from being arrested. And they ended up just being thrown in the van along with everyone else. So I got myself nominated as the legal aid and went straight to the Greylin and ponsoned me guys and said, look, you're here because of blah, 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 and it's got nothing to do with anything you did. Um, and I'm going to talk to each of your parents about this. So I did. I rang from the police station to each of the parents and said, look, your son has been arrested uh, for nothing. And I want you to come down here and, and see for yourself. Because there was at the time nothing on the charge books. And even the inspector in charge of that shift wanted to know why isn't there anything on the charge book? You just have holding these people illegally. And so uh, some of the parents, when I'd rung them, this was quite early in the morning, uh, they were, first of all, the initial shock that their son was involved in this kind of thing. And, and when they came and saw for themselves, you know, that these things actually do happen, that authority does make mistakes, uh, and they're not always right. That's when I think, at least for those parents, something changed for them. The Panthers weren't lawyers, but they recognised injustice when they saw it, and they knew knowledge was power. They developed and distributed resources to educate their communities. One of their most successful publications was this legal aid book, written with the help of a young lawyer by the name of David Longy. One does not like to see people rather helpless in the face of a system they don't understand. But we definitely need a system where a defendant knows that he can have legal representation. How, how was your relationship with David, like, given, you know, um, that he David had... David Longy? Yeah, and he David Longy saved my that. life, Nivak. I, um... It goes like this. One night I'm, I'm out with my friends and we're drinking and one of my friends happens to be a Māori who's good at stealing cars. So he said, oh, I'll save us a trip back to Ponsonby. I'll get us a car. So he go and got us a car and we all jump in and we get chased to Hearn Bay and dog catches me by the arm and I end up in prison and court and the Panthers come down, Will comes down, my mum comes down, the whole she bang lot and I'm thinking, oh, God. Oh, God, you know, I know what's ahead of me. The Panthers come down and they bring David Longy as my lawyer. And David Longy represents me and lays down such a beautiful story that the judge feels sorry for me and lets me off and gives my friend three years. If I'd have gone into prison, I'd be a different person. I'd come out full of hate and busting, yeah. It must have been hard for young Pacific Islanders not to become hostile towards a police force who they believed was systematically racist. How are you? Good, good. Vince Tui Samoa shared the frustrations of many of those growing up in this environment. There was no youth club, OK? So where do youth go to? Hey, besides, besides what, what they call youth town now, it used to be known as boys town. But they also had laws, and the funny thing about it was, the only way that you could get to, to Boys Town or U Town was to catch a bus. Now, looking at the economic situation of a lot of our families, we weren't rich. So you beat the feet. But beating the feet meant that you could be picked up as a vagrant for having no money in your pocket, which the police could use. In response to what the Panthers perceived as police harassment, they decided to turn the tables on the law and monitor police activities. They set up the Pig Patrol. What was the Pig Patrol? Uh, Pig Patrol, what it stood for was Police Investigation Group. Aye. And all it was was us watching them doing their job. And it was our views on what we saw of our people being treated. See, so that police officer's like just there. What, you just leave that one alone, would you? Well, we would, we would, we would find out where the where the paddy wagons were because where the paddy wagons were was the task force. Oh look, we've lost him. 
See, would I, would, would I have done a U-turn there? Is that what I was supposed to have done? Yes. Oh, man. Yes. I would have sucked. Yes. By the mid-70s, Pacific Islanders were regular scapegoats for rising unemployment and social problems. The flames of prejudice and racism were fanned for unscrupulous political gain. One of the most telling things I found searching through the archive is Muldoon's 1975 National Party election advertisement. People said they were nice places to bring up children. But the cities grew alarmingly. People poured in, not just from the country, but from other countries as well. You had these cartoon characters of curly-haired people, real dark-skinned people, and big lips and big noses. Then one day, there weren't enough jobs either. The people became angry, and violence broke out, especially among those who had come from other places expecting great things. And that was leading up to the so-called immigration, the dawn raids. Hey, they were blaming the islanders for the misfortunes of the Europeans. It was dawn raids, catch them while they were asleep. Even though there, there was um, a, a majority of overstays from South Africa and England, they pick on the Tongan and the Samoan overstays in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So they form a, a, a special squad to go out early in the mornings to dawn raid, break down Pacific Island people's doors, um, demand flash, um, flashlights in their faces and demand for their identity and passports to make sure that they're legally here and not overstayers. When they started bringing in the laws about overstays, it was, Islanders, we don't need them no more. Strange. Hey, strange, when my father worked the roads, when our people worked in the factories, worked in the laundries, that no other person wanted to do. And who did they blame? The P.I.s? They came inside, they found this other chap. And, uh, was the other chap hiding? No, he wasn't. He was sitting here talking with us. And um, he asked them about his passport and he said he hasn't got it handy. So they said that we're about to live. So they take him up to Papa Toy where he lives. And they've gone there to try to find his passport. That's right. My mum got a phone call. Mum was a social worker. There was a 19-year-old Samoan girl. I think she was 19. Uh, but anyway, a young girl. Baby no older than about two months. That snatched her from a house. OK? All she had, and this is not being crude, but she's had the lava lava, no female undergarments, and in a holding cell, the baby had a nappy, a T-shirt. And when she asked for milk to feed the baby, the priest just sort of says, ah, oh, there's the milk you can use for, we're giving you for the coffee. So we had to, mum, mum rung me up and I had to go back and go get her the things that a female needs. Because half past six that morning, she was on the plane, back to Samoa. So we decided to dawn raid the ministers. We gave them the full, you know, outside the house. We had the lights blaring, you know, in our black gears and the loud hail and say, we're members of the Aotearoa Liberation Movement. You have 24 hours to prove that you have, you're rightfully allowed to stay in this country. Uh, fortunate enough, I had a friend who was working for Radio Hauraki at the time, who got, you know, who rang up the minister on air asking him what was happening, and he said on, on live radio, how dare these people come at this ungodly hour? And it's exactly what we, you know... That was the point. That was the point. And I think it took him two and a half weeks, and there were no more door raids. The Panthers' biggest eviction battle was yet to come. In 1976, the government moved to sell Ngāti Whātua land to property developers. Tangata Whenua began an 18-month occupation to try to prevent further land sales. In a show of Pacific solidarity, the Polynesian Panthers joined them. This place is Crown Land. I have the lawful authority and duty to prevent unlawful trespassing 
or intrusion upon or occupation of this place. I remember when I, uh, you know, when I was at Bastion Point, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, Dad came to me, one, one day Dad said to me, he said, you know, why for you go up there? You're not a Māori, mm -hmm. you know? And I said to him, I said, Dad, how would you feel if you lost your land? Because, you know, us Tongans get a piece of land. Three weeks later, he convinced his church group and they sent up six trucks of food. Mm. Alongside the Panthers was MP Hone Hanaweta, who back then was a member of the Māori political movement Ngāta Matoa. So by the time Best and Point came around, we were really comfortable with each other. Eh? Yeah. Uh, Will, Kingi, all of the... Usual suspects. Oh, usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Will, he was a movie star back in those days, eh? Well, certainly Will thought he was... I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 he was a uh, uh, big black guy, uh, articulate, yeah. uh, good looking and uh, good sense of humour, but knew what he, what he had to say and the message that he had to say it. So I was impressed, very impressed. I thought that they were very staunch. Yeah. Um, they brought a sense of purpose and uh, also a small degree of menace. And the thing I liked about the Panthers was they provided us a connection to, uh, to a section of the New Zealand community that nobody really gave a shit for. Yeah. Uh, the Pacific Island community. Nobody really gave a damn for it. Nobody at all. After 506 days of occupation, Ngāta Matoa and the Polynesian Panthers stood with Ngāti Whātua as they were dragged off their land by hundreds of police and armed services. Thankfully, much of that land has since been returned to Ngāti Whātua. Polynesian Panthers were part of a worldwide youth revolution. I'm off to San Francisco, home to the organisation that inspired them, the Black Panther Party. In the 60s, San Francisco was a hotbed of youth radicalism, political protest and going up against the establishment. It was the birthplace of African-American revolutionary left-wing organisation, the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were founded by Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton. They wanted self-determination, an end to discrimination and to protect African-Americans from police brutality. I'd met artist Emery Douglas a year earlier when he was in New Zealand and he encouraged me to make this documentary. Emery was the Black Panthers Minister of Culture. Uh, I came to a place called the Black House. That's where a lot of cultural activities go on. And I seen Bobby had this newspaper where he had designed the logo and he had typed out the text with a, on a typewriter. And so I told him I could go home and get my, some of my art materials that may help improve what he was doing. Sure. And so they said, okay. And so I went, and it took me about an hour to walk there and back. And when I came back, they were surprised that I came back. But they said, well, he was finished with that, but you seem to be committed, and we're fixing to start this newspaper. And we want you to be the revolutionary artist for the newspaper. At its height, the Black Panther paper was getting Emery's artwork and their message out to hundreds of thousands of people all around the world. I've asked Emery to take me to the Black Panther archive. I want to know if there was any real relationship between the Black Panthers here and the Polynesian Panthers at home. Welcome, come on in. Hey, nice to meet you. Come on, no Bye, Brother Emery, what's going on? Hey, All right. Hey. Welcome to the museum. Come on in. All right. 
this is our home, but we converted it into like a little museum on Black Panther Party history and the history of the 60s and 70s. Now, of, of the 1960s, this is probably the most popular poster there was. If you didn't have one of these posters, you were not even hip. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, everybody, everybody had, had this. this is it right here. This is, it cost, I think it might have cost two or three dollars at that time, but everybody had a Huey in the chair poster. You know? Tell me, Billy, did you manage to find any, any articles or anything like that from the Polynesian Panthers that perhaps you might have? Yes, I did, matter of fact. Oh, did you? Yeah. I looked through our archive and I remember that in around 70, 74, that uh, we started making contact and there was members of the Polynesian Panther Party came over. I think a couple of these issues right here, this particular issue here, Polynesian Panther Party win respect and, report, and support. Is and this Ama? is May 30th. Is that Ama? I think it is. 1974. And this particular paper here, I think there's other issues here that kind of that put the spotlight on the Polynesian Panther Party also. Okay, the PPP also organized a, a police investigation group. They organized a legal first aid, prison, prisoner's aid, political education classes. And this particular one talks about uh, the widespread oppression in uh, New Zealand. Do you fellas even know where New Zealand was back then? No, I didn't. No. I knew it was out there somewhere. <laughs> well, see, the thing about it is, is a party is like, like the voice of the people, right? Yeah. And so when uh, the Polynesian Panther Party started, that only made our voice echo even bigger because it reached more people out in the Pacific, sure. you know? And now, you know, the, the policies are what the struggle was about was universal. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we was for human rights, we were for uh, legal rights, we were for equality, and those are things in common oppressed people fight for. The struggle was universal, but here it was intense. The Black Panthers fought the police on the streets and in the courtrooms. When Panther founder Huey Newton went on trial for the murder of a policeman, the Free Huey movement began on the Alameda courthouse steps outside. Wow, this is a pretty extraordinary mm -hmm. courthouse. Yeah, this is, is what we used to have all the rallies, Free Huey rallies, this is it. This is when you see the pictures of the Panther Center, and the fists up in the air with the placards on the stairs. That was all out here. Newton's case was eventually dropped. Other Panthers weren't so lucky. The next place Emery took me to was named after a teenage boy who was killed by Oakland police in 1968. I lived Bobby Hutton was uh, 17 years of age, I just turned 17, when he got murdered uh, April 6, two days uh, after uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. They were traveling uh, the night before with other Panthers because it was going to be a picnic here the next day. And we were trying to encourage the community not to riot, riot because they would be basically just tearing up their own property and stuff like that in this neighborhood. Yeah. Police swooped down on them and uh, some of them got out of their cars and ran into different directions. And little Bobby and Eldridge Cleaver ran into a house on 28th Street in this neighborhood. And from there, uh, the shoot shots were fired at them into the house, many, many rounds, tear gas. Finally, they were forced out the house, and little Bobby he was, in essence, murdered. Hey, how are you? Mm. Emery had just one more person to introduce me to, a woman who lost her husband in a gun battle in 1969. The day that John Huggins and Al Prentice Bunchy Carter were killed. We were trying to leave the house because we knew that they would come for us. Not because we'd done anything wrong, but we, that was the way they operated. And the police converged on the house. They forcibly opened the door downstairs and stood in the door with their guns pointed at us. 
They took me in a separate car and they drove me to the morgue. But they didn't drive me to the morgue because they wanted me to identify John. They drove me because they wanted to bring additional harm. And then they took us to the notorious 77th Street Police Precinct Station. And this old-fashioned bulletin board said something like, score at the top. Panthers 11, like a ball, a ball game score. Panthers 11, pigs zero. I think we thought we would see the results of revolution in our lifetime. That was one of our mottos. Yeah. <coughs> and we didn't, but I do think we made an indelible impression in the hearts and minds of people in communities like this. No wonder the city takes the Black Panther legacy seriously. Black Panthers died, some are still in prison. No one was killed in New Zealand, but you take the guns out of it, and the struggle my uncle faced wasn't so very different. The universality of the Panther movement became obvious as the Polynesian Panthers took on the struggle of black South Africans. When the Springbok rugby team landed in 1981, it was the closest contemporary New Zealand has come to civil war. There's the plane coming in very low over Eden Park. It seems to me to be just, uh, just above the grandstand height. In 1981, the New Zealand Rugby Union invited the racially selected Springboks from apartheid South Africa to tour New Zealand. Each game was met by increased protest and resistance, and at the final game at Auckland's Eden Park, just a stone's throw away from Ponsonby, the Panthers faced their final battle. Players made an attempt to come onto the field. For Uncle Will and the Panthers, the tour was a demonstration of support for apartheid, and it had to be stopped no matter what the cost. These tapes are from the police video unit. They were used to help bring prosecutions against protesters, including my uncle, Wani Harawira, and Tinginess. It, it wasn't just a venting of, of you know, frustration and anger. Nah, there was a reason for it. Apartheid was the beast that we, we have to slay. Your convictions have to be that strong, you know, to, to stop the shaky knees and knees knocking together, you know, and the, oh, I don't want to do this, you know, and you think, yep. Yeah, Someone's got to do it. As we got closer to the park, it became clear to me that uh, if we were going to do something, we needed to have some kind of concerted leadership. Right. So as I looked around, I saw Will, and I immediately thought, OK, here's a guy I can work with. So I went and grabbed him. I said, bro, we've got to get this organised. Um, you, you're a guy I can count on. And he told me what some of the things he was already doing. I said, oh, shit, that fits exactly with what we're doing. And so we, 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 uh, you know. Just that, oh, shit, right, there's a mole, I can see this thing. We're all helmeted up and this is just big, huge melee going on with the police and the Red Squad. What happened to you? Yeah, I got um, whacked um, across the face, but I whacked him back too, yeah. So some of us broke through, Honi broke through too, you see, because we, we, we decided, let's go, poof. So Honi's in here as well? He's already gone through. Oh, yeah. And the trouble is that when we came back, the other squad came back. Oh, yeah, and, and there's so, you, you're down yeah. here, and this, that's you there. Got caught. With the red jacket on. <laughs> I mean, they had these batons and things, they had, you know, four on each side. You know, and because I wouldn't go down, they just 
so that, you know, so I have four battens on the, on the side of me, in me, and then you just went whack. And then I just remember these arms just picked me up. This guy just said, just keep your feet going, babe, just keep your feet going. And they just <laughs> carried me along through these houses. And People opened up their doors to let us run through their house, and then the next house would open up and let us run through, you know, to get out of there. You know. This is after a good two, three hours scrapping. So that's what happened. The day Auckland City out in the suburbs had burnt. As Panthers, we've always been prepared to go the, all the way. For me, I know that I can say, yeah, we are lucky to be alive today and tell the story. Did you have any idea that that's what you were up for? Lives on the line? Yeah, we were, we were all set to go. I mean, you know, um, when, they, when they charged me, I, I was facing 10 years. Because they had me, I organised the, I organised the Patu squad. We had uh, the top fighters from all the street gangs. Uh, and so we were all ready to, to get to battle. Um, and, and we did, you know, in, in the court case, they said 36 members of the Red Squad that we fought with, 24 after the battle, 24 were permanently injured, they couldn't work anymore, you know. So we, we did our thing and we, we you know, uh, we did it. Ting and them went to prison. Um, Hone and I went to trial for two, year, uh, for two years. In the aftermath, Tingi was one of the many who went to jail for standing up for human rights. My Uncle Will and Hone Harawera endured a two-year trial and only avoided prison when Archbishop Desmond Tutu flew in from South Africa. He spoke movingly about apartheid and acknowledged the stand that Hone and Uncle Will had made. When Bishop Desmond Tutu came in and gave that statement that we were liberators, humanitarians and, and not criminals, and it took the jury an hour and f 10 minutes to come out and find us not guilty, when I was walking out of the, uh, um, the trial, the uh, cops, um, them the Red Squad, and they said, um, we'll get you fucking it all out here. So I knew that I was gonna be, they're gonna trump up something, so I shot over to Tonga. I've clashed with these guys from the Panther days. They were in the task force, Bastion Point. I clashed with these guys and then with Patu Squad, you know, they, they were just getting tired of me getting off all the time. So I, I felt I was going to either get hurt or uh, get done for something, because, you know, so I, I split off and went to Tonga. So after more than 10 years of battling with authority and running community development programs, that was effectively the end of the Polynesian Panthers. It's all about having inspirational leaders and, you know, Will was that. I always respect Will for that, making that initial step and then bringing us all on board and being, you know, we wouldn't be following an, an idiot. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he did give us that kind of, you know, mana. Yeah. Um, and He's got we a believed like in me, my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, you've come from the same genes. <laughs> But you know, and it's it's a gift. It was a gift, and I think he's done. He d he did really, you know, well, in in what he did with the Panthers. I think. Well, we didn't know anybody who thought like that. No. Yeah. There just sure. wasn't anyone on the horizon who thought like he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it just sort of had to happen. It it, it had to happen. Um, you know, we I, we couldn't conceive of New Zealand as it is today without the voices uh, of people in the 1970s. In terms of people's rights, in terms of people's identities, in terms of people's cultures, in terms of people's economic situation, uh, you know, we're a million miles from where we were then, but it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have moved um, if people hadn't begun to speak up. You know, it's easy to forget that it takes, it takes uh, 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 at the beginning, only a small number of people to speak up. What are you most proud of? Uh, you. I mean, in terms of the PPP. Yeah, that's what I meant. People like yourselves. My, oh, my, what's my, most proud of is our children. When I see my children and my mockles, you know, doing well and knowing that uh, 
they've got a better chance than we would have yet. Part of me really feels for my uncle. Much like Tingy and a number of the other members, you know, they made some huge sacrifices, not just in terms of wealth, but, you know, in terms of relationships, the way that they were viewed by other members of their family, other people within the community. You know, the privileges that I enjoy today and that, you know, my son enjoys today are a direct result of the stand that, that people like my uncle took. And I just feel that there are so many people that don't even know what the Polynesian Panthers are today that, um, that this makes us even more special and even more important. Forty years ago, the Polynesian Panthers set out to improve our people's lives. We've made gains, but are still among the poorest, least educated and most imprisoned of New Zealand society. The Panthers started the journey. It's up to us to keep it going. New Zealand on air.